All right, I'm delighted to say that Dermot Ling is back in an off-the-ball studio. You're welcome back, Dermot. Yeah, thanks very much, Owen. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. We're here to talk about uh, the Wild Irish Retreat. For anybody who hasn't heard of this, what is the Wild Irish Retreat? Um, I suppose the one probably most relevant to Off the Ball is, well, there's, there's three different retreats, and it's a kind of a, a rewilding Oscoelge. Um I think I'm a, as good a representation as I have been for a while on <laughs> rewilding um, at the late night and early morning. But it's, I suppose with the retreat, it's... I, from my experience here even like of moving from the city out and feeling that I needed to probably connect into something in myself that was a little bit stronger than what I was working off from here like I found the, like, the, the potential and the possibility in Dublin was always fantastic and the mm. people and you know it was just but I found I was always busy and never kind of had time to I was always going somewhere onto something something else and so I remember in the move that I made west, I kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time in, in open space and in wilder spaces to see why I was maybe chasing that busyness or why I was looking for that and what was the, what was beyond it. And yeah, I found a great strength in it. I found a great value in it. The more I went into it and the more, you know, eating wild food, out swimming in the sea in, in the middle of winter and climbing mountains and just, yeah, out 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 in nature more often than not. And I met a fantastic woman down there and I, I didn't expect... I didn't expect I didn't expect that definitely. Um, I expected that to happen if anywhere in Dublin. But what I expected um, was to be in. But she was. She said to me, "No, no. A house is just shelter for when the weather is is bad or whatever. We're out other than that. Mm. Always out, out, out doing whatever you want to be doing outside." And so that was a whole other. I had never thought of that. Like I grew up in Mexer Town, and we were, you know, you'd you'd be a going to things obviously outside. But this idea of like being outside almost all of the time was totally not really foreign to me. So it was through that and through engagement with the language, I found great shelter and great strength in the Irish language as well. The more and more that's come to life inside of me, the more I've realised that it's not just a school language, uh, you know, something that you see a subject in school, it's just you see something in English, you see something in Irish, that the Irish language is actually a way of seeing the world that's different to English, like that allows you to see the world in a different way. And I find in a very relevant way to the current uh, ecological kind of crisis that we're, that we're facing in some way, the Irish language has a great understanding of the rhythms of, of nature. Not that English doesn't have it, but it's just, it's, I think it's native to us in a way that makes sense to us, you know. How so? so is that like the way it sounds, the sort of lilt of the Irish language, or, or how does that manifest itself? I think maybe in some senses in the, yeah, the poetic, onomatopoeic nature of it in one way, but I think also in the words, I just went to see Manicon McGann's show, um, Aran Agassim, and he takes you through a list of, of different words and the kind of the movement that's behind them, like the actual, the measurement of things <clears throat> and the explanation on things are carried in a more, in, a, in, an, in an, the use of a natural movement of, of, of a weather pattern. Or, I remember coming across a word one, um, a couple of years ago and it was actually the explanation of the word that blew me away and it was the, the description of, the, of a bad pint and it was a raindrop that comes down through a thatched roof and rolls down the side of the wall and that you would collect that and drink it. <laughs> That's how bad the end of the pint was. And I thought, <clears throat> and, it, and it tells its own story that I can't remember the word, but I thought that they'd have a word for that, that there would, that there, there would be that kind of a description. So a word that just impacts your, you know, you move from word to word very quickly, but a word like that has such gravity to it. It has a whole story behind it and a whole imagery behind it, and that's just one word. And if you have that in a kind of list of sentences, all of a sudden there's there's a greater I don't know there's a greater energy in it, you know. Yeah. And I mean, it makes perfect sense anyway. <clears throat> the whole idea of stripping us of our language in the first place was to weaken us. And I mean, to me, the ultimate revolutionary act in the country at the moment would be to take it back because I think it's to strengthen us. And that was definitely my experience. I feel like my life is enriched immeasurably from going back into the Irish language. It may be just my own experience, but I, I get to, uh, we've run a couple of these retreats now, and there was a particular bit of feedback that I was interested in because if I have this opinion, it has to be you have to be able to back it up with somebody who experiences the retreat and says, 
hang on there now, like you can't go around making those claims if, mm. it's, if it's not accurate, you know. But there was one of the girls on the retreat last year, Sinead, and I was I chatted to her up in Dublin here afterwards. Um, I, I just happened to meet her, and I was asking her, like, you know, I wanted to really, like, how was it? Was it, you know, was it of value to you? And she said she ended up doing a, a TV interview for work the following week, and she's never done one before, but she said during the interview she just felt this surge of strength and she just said I, I really feel like I, I found that down in uh, in West Kerry you know um, so Dushik de Gokas we call it which is a, to awaken your heritage and this idea of, of letting your heritage flow through you letting your culture flow through you a little bit more is a possibility that I think we're sitting on that we're not maybe tuning into as much because or maybe it, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I, I, yeah, I won't follow that one too far. Well, uh, it's up on screen uh, at the moment, the poster for that, and uh, the, there's one at the start of June, the 14th to the 16th, but the 28th, 29th and 30th as well mm. uh, is, is one as well, and th they're all in, in West Kerry, Dermot, are they? They are. They're all overlooking Count Chabale, just off the back of Ballyferter, and it's a it's a place where I yeah, live lived for a couple of years and collected, uh, you know, collected wild food. Went down at low tide to collect the seaweed and played hurling on the beaches and swam and climbed the cliffs for sunsets, looking over the blaskets. And so I, I know the. I know the terrain so well and you just want to kind of share it with everybody because it's so magical, you know. But I, we tried to do it on the Blaskets the first year because I had I'd spent a bit of time on the Blaskets and the weather intervened, thankfully, because we just wouldn't have had the ability to have a yoke. There's no flat, there's no flat right. land on the Blaskets. <laughs> like, so it, it would have been an absolute nightmare, but it, it, it was, it's, it's worked. It's worked. Uh, yeah, we've been delighted. Uh, the first year was a little bit chaotic because we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into, but the second time now it was really uh, it was really yeah really powerful and we, we run a ritual as well um, and I know that word has connotations and I don't want to tend to them too much but um, a sweat lodge um, that we build and so that'll be part of it as well it, you with sally rods and you make a bender and put blankets and um, sheets and stuff over it and hot stones in the middle and it's like this, this outdoor kind of wild sauna and it's a kind of a, an old cleansing ritual of, of Celtic Ireland right. um, so it's yeah, it's 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 out of my comfort zone in many respects as well. Like you know, I don't come from that. I don't come from that type of uh, life. But I I see definitely, I see the I see the benefits of it. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like what what do you think it was? You you kind of touched on it already. The impact that going and experiencing more of the outdoors had on your love for Irish. Those two things, as you said, are linked. But what what do you think it is specifically? Yeah, they are intertwined. All right, I. I don't. We go to this Irish class on a, in, on a Friday morning in in uh, in Dingle, and it's really an exploration of the, of the language. And there's a guy who runs a Tus MacGerald, and he he's a, like an old fisherman farmer, and he has all of the language of all of the old tools and the old the movements of the weather and stuff like that. Like he has all of this old terminology that, that's gone and and maybe in some sense is useless now, you know. Maybe it is useless because we don't cut turf ourselves or mm. anything like that. Like so what that instrument is called is maybe can be viewed as, as useless. But I found that I had to put a language on what I was experiencing and I, the language that came most naturally to that was it, it came through Irish. Now I don't know like, I mean, talking about meeting the, the woman that I met down there, like, I, I can remember, you know, it happened, it happened to me too, definitely, where I had just met somebody and sent a text and <clears throat> maybe half an hour later, thinking, oh, geez, what did, I, what did I actually say in the text? You know, I'd be reading back over it and it was all, it was all in Irish. Like, right. you know, our, this, this old courtship was in Irish. And I remember reading back over it and I was like, geez, I'm a poet. Like, this is like, <laughs> this is magical. And, and I'm not like... Do you know? But it, it did she was, think you were a poet? She thought oh, she was convinced of it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to tell her eventually. Yeah, maybe I haven't told her yet. So now, um, <laughs> if you're watching, but yeah, no, it it just it, it flowed so so naturally, and and then you know any kind of any little small awakenings that you that you have, and no different to you or any of the lads here. Like I've chatted to Jar and Joe enough about it. It's like when you discover something. You want to just share with people, yeah. And when I discovered since since leaving hurling and and stepping outside the GA world a little bit and trying to look back in to see where can I find a role that's of value, I have found that giving people who have never played the game or people who were burned by the game at a young age, you know, artists, musicians, people who didn't have that 
drive to kill the fellow up the road because he was from up the road. <clears throat> they were kind of surplus to requirements, I think, for a long time in the GA, and I think maybe that's ch- changing a little bit. But it's still that you know uh, very competitive edge that maybe drives out people who are maybe more into expression or whatever. I don't know. Um, and I found giving those people a hurl and just letting them play, and I and I call it wild hurling, I suppose, because. There is no rules. There is no, there, there, there's a, a container of a game created, and it's a little bit like f- a cross between American football and and uh, like and hurling a possession type game. But it can be played anywhere, on any pitch between anybody. Seven year olds play it with sixty year olds. Like we've done all of that on the retreat, and I see the yeah the, uh, the sharing of generations is a is a thing that's kind of yeah it's limited enough that that happens i think in society now so even even getting people like that together if i'm very good and somebody else is very weak i have a responsibility as the very good one to create a little bit more space for the one who's very weak to maybe learn a little bit more so i don't go and try and take the ball off them very very aggressively i just give them a little bit of space so they can learn a little bit mm. but i'm still trying to win i'm still trying to get the ball and i'm still trying to score and i'm still competitive and i expect everybody else to be competitive too but it's not forced it's not like you know the outcome isn't as, as relevant nearly as just looking around and seeing people smiling ear to ear who don't play who have never played hurling, you know, a little bit of a return to it. And I, we give the, the ash, we give the hurl to visiting dignitaries at times. And sometimes I just, I think, well, I, I kind of have an image somewhere in my head, like of a scabbard and everybody's back, like a leather scabbard with a hurl in it, like everywhere, just in case a game breaks out somewhere, mm. you know, in a field or on a beach. or That it doesn't have to be on a pitch between the lines. It doesn't yeah. have to be that iteration. But that's the GA iteration, but it's a very, very valuable thing. And Sheenie Mack, I like, experienced it, and, and it gave me so much in my life. But it's more than that. The game is much more than that. It's much bigger than that, you know, and I think maybe we're forgetting that a little bit, you know. Yeah, I was just about to ask, do you think that that sort of kind of more philosophical view on things is seen as a weakness in some GEA circles? Um, I don't know. I don't know that it is. Um, everywhere, everywhere I go, I definitely, when I bring that in somewhere, I always get the feeling that it's not welcome because I think that too as like wherever that thought arose mm. in you, that arises in me too. I'm like, maybe they're looking at me thinking, you know, what's wrong with that fellow? But I don't ever actually, when I go back to my club or when I go back, when I talk to any GA people, like, <clears throat> I get the sense that they feel I'm putting words, now obviously not all of them, there's people who think I'm probably, you know, batshit crazy and that's fine, but a lot of them and the ones in particular who I would respect think, you know, kind of putting words on something that we all suspect or no and that's a, the feedback that I get a lot mm. and so and that because I wouldn't continue on it if I just went around thinking this and everybody was saying hey what, what are you talking about you wouldn't keep saying it you'd look for where else you can add value like you know I'm, I'm looking for my purpose in the world every bit as much as anybody else and when I feel like I've landed on it I follow it with everything I have until there's enough feedback to say that's that, yeah that's not the way to go and then you look kind of look again you know so I think there are possibilities in, in, in the GA like I'm interested in what the social power of yeah the GA, GA players, GA clubs is. We do tremendous, uh, there's trem- it obviously serves communities around the country uh, tremendously, but I think sometimes the idea of community can be a little bit narrow. Um, the GA community is what it is, maybe more than the greater community, and I think we, we need to start, if we're going to probably combine and combat, like I, I don't really think that electric cars and carbon trading and carbon sinks are going to solve the ecological crisis that, we, that we're facing ahead of us. I think it's in organisations like the GA reaching out, combining more to see what, what strengths do we have that offer um, healing, that offer solutions to, to, to some of our most pressing problems, you know. So it's, I'm interested in those bridges between um, not even organisations but people, like because the GA people are a certain people, hurling people yeah. within the GA people are, are a certain people. So it's just, who, what are the bridges and how can we cross them maybe a little bit more, you know? Well, I, I do want to get into the hurling on the pitch, but like that's a very interesting point you've raised there, the bridge between the GA and some of those crises, especially ecological crises. Mm. What is that bridge? How, like, how, how is that seen in, in, say, five or ten years' time? Yeah, it's, a, it's great. It's, um, it's a lovely question because I feel... There are, I think that you're going to meet, there's going to be answers 
to these questions naturally. This is, like I was facilitating for a while and I would go in and you'd have everything controlled and this is okay, with, after half an hour we'll be here and an hour we'll be here and then we'll bring this in and there's this like presentation version <clears throat> not for not for facilitation that way maybe, but there's more of an organisation on what I was doing and I was afraid of what could come in and so I would control what I could or maybe more as a teacher not as a, as a facilitator with that and I, found, I find now that it's actually I'm controlling a little small bit and I'm leaving a big space so stuff can come in mm. and I find with in, in answer to the question that something like the ash dieback disease which is which is a serious threat to the ash trees of Ireland is probably going to wipe out maybe 99% uh, of, our, of our ash trees which is a significant amount seeing as we, we have so many and I wonder, do we have, like, you often hear people now, it's a, quite a common thing to be critical of the win-at-all-cost culture, but sometimes I wonder, but wh wh where's the, the solutions often take place, I think, within the same culture? And sometimes I think by looking outside, you actually, there's some natural answers waiting for us if we just could be silent enough to listen to them. And I think the ash dieback disease actually represents that possibility because when the GA is moving more and more, I think as it seems at the top level at least, towards a, a more corporate version of, of, the, of, of the game, uh, following a few years behind rugby, following a few years behind soccer, following a few years behind American sport, I think, in that trajectory. I think that we have a possibility through the ash dieback to actually reroute. Like, do we have a responsibility, the ash tree, that has given us this possibility to play this game? Like, do we sincerely have a responsibility to it? And I believe that we do. And I think that we will, if, if, if the case may be that it would be a valued plant, 200,000 or 500,000 ash trees and there was an army of planters needed and we've got a full army and 100 years ago we needed a military army but now we don't need a military army, we need a different type of army and we have that in the GA and if that's what the ash tree needs, are, are we willing to come together as a community and as a club, take responsibility for the ash tree, plant those trees and hope that we find more resistant strains to, for the ash tree to survive mm. and in that very action there's that action towards the ash tree but in that very action there is a rerouting in something that's bigger than the game and it's bigger than just us as people it's like we're taking care again of this world around us and in doing that the, the, the disease is giving us the disease is the medicine you know the disease is giving us the opportunity to actually look outside of our little small human world and reconnect with the greater world that I believe has maybe more answers for us than we realise and I've certainly found that in my life I found far more I found an, an awful lot out, by looking outside then, yeah, then maybe that pursuit of from within the the community. You know, I don't think I don't think capital has the power to solve these these issues. You mm. know, I just I just don't. But with it all cost mentality, the say no to complacency sort of attitude probably does. And like I think that's a very very interesting point that you raised. That mm. the attitude is there if you channel it into other things, you can. Uh, it's undoubtedly yeah. there. Yeah, it's undoubtedly there. I know that's go it's going off on a little bit. Of a, yeah, but I, I think I think these are it's a value to. And I, uh, yeah, I think it's a value. I hope. So, yeah. Hugely, it absolutely is. Uh, we should talk a little bit about the hurling and uh, yeah, yeah, uh, in a strange way the man who's uh, been spoken about more than anybody else is uh, not a hurling superstar this week. It's uh, Greg Kennedy, the, the Dublin selector who came onto the pitch and caught that ball mm. uh, against uh, Kilkenny in Nolan Park on Saturday night. What did he make of this? Um, I, I mean... I, the minute it happened, in, I'd say in the second replay from behind, I, I would have taken Don Log Cusick's line on it. Like, in, some people said instinctively he put up his hand to catch it, and in some senses he did do that instinctively. But he ran over and marked him. Like, mm. He saw what was happening, ran over and marked him, and then when the ball came over, he he caught it, and it was a great little passage of play and somebody said from my, my home club he said he's, uh, the Dublin really came out of the game after uh, Greg Kennedy went off or they really fell out of the game after Greg Kennedy went off and it was like I, you can't, I don't think it can happen really and I'm not a big I'm not a big kind of rules person I think that you know that everything should be enforced in a certain way but He's, he's stepping in onto the field and that's fine, there's, there's, there's probably space for that definitely because messages have to be gotten across and stuff like that but he, he, he took the referee's job into his hands, basically. He said, this free shouldn't take place. Now, he did it when the, ga the game wasn't in play, and f for that reason, it wasn't as serious as if it was in play. But at the same time, he did the referee's job. He said, no, no, you can't take that free yet. So 
bring it back and take it again, and that's not Greg Kennedy's role. No. So from that point of view, and it's interesting because they were they were saying on I think maybe on, on just live in the game how much Kilkenny came into it afterwards. Yeah, and I remember playing against Galway in two thousand and seven in the league quarter final, and I went in on like maybe one of the Burks. I went to try and burst one of them by the shoulder, and I was never very good at, at doing that anyway, and I missed him. And I went in, didn't I go in only to Sean Tracy on the far side, who's a giant of a man. And I, I kind of just kept going because I couldn't stop, you know, I was on the sideline. And I burst it into him. And Tracy turned around to me and he gave me a dig at a hurl into the ribs. And I was like, brilliant. Like, this is, br- I was delighted. And I flew it for the rest of the game because it was just such a, such a moment of, of, of aliveness in the game, you know. So... It happens from time to time, and, and so I don't. I'm not. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be so critical of it. But in that case, with yeah, I don't think he can be doing the referee's job. Like that's probably not why he's there. Yeah, yeah. T- Tommy Walsh is on your side as well in terms of bringing Nolan Park alive on Saturday night. How far are Kilkenny off the top themes in terms of winning in All Ireland this year? I think we sometimes forget how close they were to Galway last year, who, uh, with the knock-on effect, were so close to, to winning uh, a back-to-back All Ireland. Mm. Uh, players wise I mean if you were to compare them for example to Tipperary on on paper after mm. uh, particularly after Sunday when they're back when, when they're, they're back. back on song yeah. like you know they're back doing it it seems like they're way off but I, I remember doing a, a, a talk with Brian Cody before down in Wexford and and I was really I was privileged to, I felt to be on the stage I and mean, when I played I had no time for, for Brian Cody at all I thought Oh, I, th- I felt he was boring, or he was like he was all, always talking about these really simple things, and I thought there must be some magic behind what this is, you know. But as as he spoke about the things that he spoke about, um, there was Jim Bulger was there with him, and he was he a good Wexford man, Jim, mm. and he was saying, "Oh, well, the time is coming to an end now, Brian," you know, and he was kind of delighting in it. Like, <laughs> and he said it has to come to an end, and Brian was like, "Well, does it have to come to an end?" And he, I, everybody at the table was like, "Well." Of course it does, Brian. And he said, well, what he was talking about was spirit, and he always talks about spirit, and I didn't understand the word until I kind of could look back in a little bit. And he said, that doesn't have to come to an end. And he's right, like, there is, um, the religion's obviously used eternal spirit for a reason. Like, that can be there. If you have a certain spirit and you maintain that spirit, performances can rise and fall. But you always see, Kenny, they're never below 85% of what their capability is, 90% of what their capability is, even if they've got poor players. Whereas with Tipperary, you have they're uh, they're at a hundred percent. Like after on, on Sunday, you know they're back to this beautiful flow and hurling. But why were they at sixty or why were they at yeah. forty? Why were they at fifty? Why were they at that? So <clears throat> in that sense, there's 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 nothing constant in that. Whereas what Brian Cody has instilled more than anything else is this idea that if you have your spirit right, everything else will kind of take care of itself. And even if you don't win, and I've played in games, Genie Mac, I've played in games where. We lost, and you know, we didn't. Things didn't go our way, but I was part of a collective effort that was like superhuman. It felt at the time, you know, synergy or whatever it is, but everything just came together. And I enjoy thinking about games like that, probably as as much as yeah, games where you won, but maybe things didn't function so well. So I don't know. Yeah, I think I think they they have that, and so they'll always be competitive. Um, and then looking at Tipperary, and if they have if they keep bringing what they're bringing, I think they're probably Limerick's biggest challengers um, in the year ahead. Yeah, is that the main reason why Tipperary looked so amazing on Sundays? That they've got that spirit back, that they've got uh, the best out of themselves in terms of caring a little bit more. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, I know that the the analysts who analyse the game in terms of the measurement of the game will definitely have a lot of good reasons as to why they're doing what they're doing. I, I'm always kind of interested in how they got to the point of, of, of doing what they're doing and it seems to be um, direct application of an ideology that they believe in the person who's saying it and that they've maybe resolved some issues that they might have had in the squad that I think have showed up in Tipperary over time like in, in, in fairness there's a reason after each all and final that they've won that you know, they've kind of disappeared for a couple, a couple of years like I don't for some reason they're not handling success so well over the, over the last 10 years <clears throat> I think they would have maybe back in the past but certainly not in a way that Kilkenny would have because you couldn't say that they didn't have the team to do it on paper mm. they, they certainly had the players to keep they should be in their fourth fifth sixth dollar and final on the bounce probably and they haven't been in that so I, they, they don't seem to have managed that very well but they, they needed um, it seems like they needed something to yeah, refocus them and I don't know why that would be I'm not privy to it obviously but Michael Ryan seemed like a, you know very yeah, he seemed to be dealing 
immediately after the one the other and with all of those potential issues it seemed like he was going to get them back on track I remember thinking okay what are they going to do here now how is this going to affect them and he seemed to be saying all the right things but they, 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 yeah, they fell apart I mean they totally fell apart and now back under Liam Sheedy um, yeah they seem to have rediscovered they're, they're doing what they're making the runs they're, they're doing what the, those extra hard yards that they weren't doing in the past so I don't know how Cork I'm not sure how it doesn't really matter in some senses I suppose like the, the the frailties of the court defence were definitely exposed, but it's it's not really in the it's not really in the mechanics of the movement. There are people there who describe that, and it's of complete utter value. But I I don't see the game that way so much. The um, court brought what they brought, but Tipperary were on. They were they were they were singing like they mm. were. Everything was working. There was an effortlessness in their movement. There was you know that that hasn't probably been there. Yeah, they were absolutely brilliant. Uh, are Limerick finally still your favourites for the All Ireland? I assume they were your favourites in the first place. I, uh, that's uh, that's a big assumption. I, I always fall into that trap, and it seems like a common thing in hurling. When Galway won the All Ireland a couple of years ago, I was like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to win it. And I remember play, I think when I was playing when Cork won the All Ireland in all four and all five, I was like, this is going to be four or five years. This it turned out that Kilkenny actually did four or five years of it. So maybe that's where it comes from. But Limerick are. Um, I know I'd, I'd have if, if if Tipperary can maintain that. I think that I think they'll, yeah, I'd, I'd say they'll definitely. I, I don't think I think it's hard to sustain what Limerick, Limerick have brought, and if there's any weakness in that, whatever that weakness is of being of it being hard to sustain over time, um, Tipperary have that freshness that would yeah would punish that. I'd say. Right. So uh, the Wild Irish Retreat. Uh, if anybody needs any more information on that, where can they go? WildIrishRetreat.com is great and Owen, yeah, I greatly appreciate coming in. Thanks very much. Not at all. Very best. Look with us, Dear Ling. Thanks, Milling, for popping in. Thanks, Owen.